Good morning. Would you please stand with me for prayer? Father God, thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you for being here with all of us. Lord, I ask you to help us to always remember that where two or three are gathered, there you will be also. I ask you to be with your servant, Pastor Hodson, today. I ask you to be with each and every individual in this building and those who are unable to make it. Guide us and protect us and help to fill us with your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please join me for the call to worship. I will read the light print and will you read the dark print with me? Come and celebrate people of God. Sing and shout your praise. For our God comes to us triumphant and victorious, yet gentle and humble of heart. He comes and brings peace, offering hope, freedom to all who despair. Let us worship God. Please have a seat. You won't be seated long. Let's turn in our hymns to hymn number 88. I sing the mighty power of God, number 88. children's story, if the kids could please come forward at this time.
Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so happy you came up to join me for a story today. Now, my story comes from when I was playing a sport. My sport is I run cross country. So every day, my teammates and I will run three, four miles to prepare. And then we'll go to a different school or to our own school and we'll run three miles against them to see who can run faster and to try to get our best time. Well, one day, my friends and I went to a different school and we were going to have a meet against them. And before each of our meets, we'll walk the other team's course so we know what we're supposed to run. And as we were walking this meet, I look around and I notice this place isn't very well marked. It's kind of hard to tell where you're going. So I started taking mental notes so I know where to go. When we started the race, and today we had three girls running, right? Myself and my two teammates. And one of my teammates was always ahead of me because she's so fast. She's really good. And as I'm running, I notice she's not ahead of me. I don't see her. But I didn't start to think much of it because usually she is far enough ahead of me that I don't notice. But as I'm running up one of the hills, my coach stops me to talk to me and says, have you seen my teammate? And I said, no, I haven't seen her. I thought she's ahead of me. So I kept running, and I didn't think much of it because I thought she was enough ahead of me. And as I was about to finish, another one of the girls from our school who had come to watch us says to me, have you seen my, te my teammate's name? And I told him, no, she's ahead of me because I thought she was ahead of me. She's a fast runner. And I finish, and my mom walks up to me and says, good job, you were the first one to finish from your team. And I got confused, like, didn't the other teammate finish before me? She said, no, she hasn't got here yet. And I started to worry, because she always comes before me. And then the third teammate comes, and she's still not there. And I went up to my coach, and I said, this person isn't here, where is she? So we started looking, and we started searching. We go up to the other team's coach, and we say, so-and-so isn't here. Where, have you seen her? Where is she? Oh, she'll be fine. She's probably just confused. She'll get here. No, she isn't here. You don't understand. She should be here. She'll be fine. So we all set out, and we're, we're taking our cars, and the other team's running after her because they know the course better than we do, and we found her. And the good news is that because we were looking so hard, we found her. Well, sometimes when we're in life, we might feel like my teammate did and don't know where you're going. You get confused, and you, you get off the track, and you're waiting for somebody to come find you. But Jesus isn't going to be like the other team's coach, is he? He's not, oh, they'll be fine. They'll show up eventually. Jesus is going to be like our teammates and the other team who went out searching for her. He's not going to let you get lost like the other coach will. He's going to be like our team, and he's going to go find you. No matter where you are, he'll find you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Sometimes we might feel lost, like my teammate did that day, and not knowing where you're going. But we thank you that you're going to come find us. You're not going to let us be alone and scared. Please help us to always know to call on you when we're afraid and we don't know where we're going. Amen. As we come into our time of congregational prayer, I ask that if you would like to come forward with praises or prayer requests, that you do so at this time. Please stand as we sing our song. as we seek the Lord in prayer.
Lord, Savior, friend, good morning and thank you for being here with us. Thank you for the opportunity of service to our church, to each other, to our community, to the world. Thank you for the sacrifice that you gave for us and showed us that we should give for others. Thank you for the rich blessings we all receive on a daily basis. Thank you for homes, for food, for comfort, for health, for employment, family, friends, freedom. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the fact that you are never more than a word away. Thank you for when we give you our sins and we give you our requests and we give you our praise that you accept them all and you handle them in the way they need to be handled. Not as we would, but as you know needs to take place. Thank you for healing. Thank you for the names that are in the bulletin and the chance we have to pray for them, which we do at this time. And thank you, Lord, that you will once again handle them in the way that they should be. Thank you for the opportunity to vision a new direction. Thank you for the chance to serve in whatever capacity we can as we try to make that a reality that aligns with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this service. Thank you for Christy and the message that she will share with us. Thank you for the opportunity afterwards to get together in fellowship. Thank you for the week ahead. And thank you for the future that only you know, but you have crafted and you are ready and willing and able in your time to give to us and to bring us home. Amen.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Proverbs 22, verse 6, which is found on page 527 in your pew Bibles. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it.
What would you do to keep your child safe? This question, it's just as valid today as it was thousands of years ago for Amram and Jochebed. They were Israelites living in Egypt, enslaved because they were both hated and feared. As their population grew, the fear of the Egyptians grew as well. And in the second book of the Bible, Exodus, the very first chapter there, we read that the fear grew to such a point that Pharaoh called for the mass murder of all newborn baby boys. Now the Egyptians, of course, were sure that they could find a purpose for all those little girls. But they underestimated the godly resistance of the Israelite midwives and mothers who refused to follow through on their orders. And God continued to bless his people even in their oppression. So Pharaoh decided he would now order his own people to be the ones to throw and get rid of all the Hebrew baby boys. He would throw them into the Nile, drowning them. Because you see, happy was the Egyptian god of the Nile, the god of fertility and the god of harvest, the god they wanted to bless them and not the Israelites. And these were the circumstances of the day in which Jochebed found herself pregnant for at least the third time. She was already the mother to a little girl, a daughter, and a three-year-old little boy. And she and her husband prayed for that life that was in her womb. She prayed for the safety of that child that was to come. So imagine the mix of joy and sorrow when she gave birth to a perfect, beautiful little boy. She had to trust that God had a plan for him, and she hid him in her home because she was not going to let her baby boy drown. But after three months, it got to be too much. So in faith, this mother built a floating basket for her son and tucked him in the reeds of the Nile, the very river in which Pharaoh wanted to use to kill became a safe haven. Watched over by his, little, by his older sister Miriam, the baby in the basket was soon spotted by the daughter of Pharaoh. She had brought her maids down to the river to bathe and she saw the basket. When it was opened, they discovered a crying child inside. Not only was it a boy, but it was a Hebrew because he'd most likely been circumcised, so they could tell. But this royal daughter of privilege felt pity for the vulnerable child. She knew that she could not follow through on the commands of her father, and so she resisted, offering faith instead of life, instead of death offering life. And this child that she would raise to be her own, he would thrive under her protection. But that was not the whole story. Because Miriam saw a chance, and she bravely approached this princess of Egypt. She offered the services of a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. Now, of course, we know the princess was smart enough to figure out that she was offering the services of the baby's mother. And she agreed. Not only would a Hebrew woman nurse the child, she'd be paid to do it as well. And this is more than just feeding the baby that was taking place. This wet nurse was the legal guardian of the baby until it went to live in the palace and the adoption was formalized. There's also a thought that from the breast milk, one's character is passed on. So this is the character that was going to be passed on to this baby. Now, we don't know how long Moses lived with his family, but we do know that it was long enough for him to understand who the God of heaven was, long enough for him to understand that he was a part of the Hebrew culture. Because even as an adult, after his schooling in the Prince of Egypt, Moses knew that he was a Hebrew. He felt a kinship to these enslaved people, so much so that he ended up killing on their behalf. 
Moses' story, if you read about his whole life, is a story of ups and downs. He was at times a prince, a killer, a wanderer, a shepherd, and a lost soul. But he was also a prophet, a leader, and a man of God. One of the things that helped him was the foundation that was laid by his family and his faith community. And it's no coincidence that the experiences of Moses that he had as a young child are what drew him back to God later on in his life. According to the Barna Research Group, two-thirds of those who accept Jesus as their savior do so before their 18th birthday. Nearly half of all Americans who have accepted Jesus Christ do it before they turn 13 years old. Additionally, people who become Christians before their teen years are more likely to remain absolutely committed to Christianity. And those who have the biggest impact on a child's acceptance of Christ are those who they spend time with the most. That would kind of make sense. Half of those who chose to follow Christ before the age of 13 say that their parents are the one who led them to Christ. This is great news. You may not think it, but your children are actually listening and watching. But they're watching and listening to more than just their parents. They're influenced by their friends and their classmates and their teachers, other adults in their lives. So each one of us has a role to play in the lives of our children those in our families, even those who don't have children like me, have a role to play. With this in mind, I want to ask you a question. Thinking of our children collectively, who is influencing our children? While they're learning about life, a foundation is being built in their lives. Now, this foundation is one that is going to have an impact on what they decide for themselves regarding the role that Jesus will have in their lives. How are we helping to build up that foundation? Are we building it on rock or on sinking sand? One of the influences in the lives of our children, of course, is their education. In the opening chapter of the book, Education, Ellen White tells us that true education means more than just the pursual of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It's the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. And this is the goal of Adventist education. It's the goal of South Lancaster Academy. I think it's down that way. The faculty, the staff, and the administrators of South Lancaster Academy, they firmly believe that SLA is not their school. It is God's school. And as such, they want to provide a stimulating academic program but also an environment that leads to character and spiritual growth. They're training our kids not just to know about Jesus, but to know him as their friend. They're memorizing multiplication tables and Bible verses, but they are also building a relationship with the creator of the universe. I wanna share a little bit of my own story. I went through Adventist education from first grade through college and then took a break and 13 years later went to my Masters of Divinity at Andrews. I started off in a two-room schoolhouse, then went to boarding academy, AUC, and Andrews for seminary. I'm going to be honest with you. It wasn't all rainbows and roses. I was bullied in both of my elementary schools, and I didn't always make the right choices. I got suspended in academy because my roommate smoked. I wasn't perfect. And here's a hint, 
I am still not perfect, and I don't know that I ever will be, and I'm okay with that. I actually stopped going to church while I was a student here at AUC. I was tired after going out Friday nights to try to find a way to relieve the stress of school and work. But during that time, I never gave up on God. I just gave up on making time for church. I'd been trained at school, at church, and at home to look at the principles of the Bible. And I never forgot the importance of thinking critically about my spiritual life. Ask anyone, they'll tell you, I don't like to do what I'm told, so I've got to think about it for myself. A rule is made to be broken, right? But I never forgot that it was my choice on my spiritual life. No one else could make that decision for me. And soon I began to feel that something was missing. The Holy Spirit was working in my heart. I began to look for a church home. I missed Sabbath school. I missed sharing and discussing about God and the Bible in a safe space. I tried a few churches because I'd moved too far away from college church here. And it took me a while to find one where I fit. But I found it. I was still going out on Friday nights but I would wake up in time for the 30-minute drive to Sabbath school. And if you know me, I'm not a morning person, so that's really a God thing. And I was lucky because the church that I found, they didn't care that I have multiple tattoos and am not ashamed of them. They didn't care that I have pierced ears. What they cared about is what I thought. They cared about me, they wanted to hear my opinions, and they wanted to make a way for me to be involved. And slowly, I made my way back fully to church, always keeping in place the critical thinking skills that were essential to my upbringing and my spiritual journey. And when I moved away again this time to Memphis, my church life stayed intact. Years later, because God has a sense of humor, God brought me back to that accepting church in Stoneham to my new calling as their pastor. And you may think that my story is unique, but it's not. Studies have shown that those who attend more years of an Adventist elementary school were also more likely to still be in church 10 years later. In fact, those who have attended Adventist schools long-term are more likely to attend church as an adult on a regular basis as opposed to those who don't. I personally have noticed what I consider a surprising trend at the various schools that I visited as well as in my friends and former classmates. Many of those who attended Adventist schools and for whatever reason no longer attend an Adventist church themselves are still choosing to send their children to Adventist schools. They understand the importance of laying the foundation for their children for spiritual and moral values, building relationships and bonds that continue long into our lives. Unfortunately, Adventist education is out of reach for many families. Many don't live close enough to an Adventist school. Thankfully, here in South Lancaster, we have an amazing school right here in our community. But another large barrier is expense. Many families simply can't afford the cost of tuition. And it doesn't mean that they don't care. It means that they need help. We're a community that loves our children and we want what's best for them. And that means that all of us need to pitch in. I know that College Church has many of their own issues to deal with, especially now that the campus across the street is a ghost town. The building is aging. 
Like many other congregations across America, the population is aging and dwindling. But that doesn't have to be the end of the story. And I commend this church for their desire to have as many children as possible at South Lancaster Academy, learning the skills that they need in this world and in the next. When it comes to supporting our children, we all need to step in and step up. First of all, pray for our children. Pray for the families in this church. Pray for the teachers and staff and administration because they have to deal with your children. Pray for our churches. There's so much in this world that distracts us. There's pain and sorrow and hardships that get in the way. And at times we're not sure how God is gonna fix any of these things. But we have to hold fast in faith and hope that ultimately God will. Because God loves his children. He loves the little children and he loves the big children like you and me. Pray that God shows you how you can help. Maybe you've got time to volunteer. Maybe you're able to cut your monthly expenses by even $5. Consider donating it to SLA for a worthy student fund. Now $5 doesn't sound like much, maybe a morning coffee, but if one person gave $5 a month for 12 months, that's $60 that you can contribute to help a child build a foundation that leads to their choice of whether they want to accept Jesus for themselves or not. If another person contributes, then you have 120. It only takes 10 people to make $600, which is about the equivalent of one month's elementary school tuition. Now, I was an accountant in my past life, so that's why you get the math. As Alyssa read for us today, we're reminded in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it. That's a call for all of us, not just parents, to be involved in laying the foundation for our young people, to give them the best opportunity available to lead them to make the choice to accept Jesus as their savior. One of the most influential ways you can do this is to partner with Adventist education. And so we ask for your help. My challenge this Sabbath is for you to pray that the Holy Spirit reveals to you the way in which you, both individually and as a church body, how you can aid SLA in lifting up our children, making their academic and spiritual lives a priority. We want them to choose Jesus because Jesus has already chosen them. Closing hymn is hymn number 101, Children of the Heavenly Father, 101.
to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. I would like to call your attention to just a couple of things in the bulletin, so if you would like to follow along, you can do so. After church is concluded today, we will be having a potluck, and the address of Ophelia and Stephen is right here in the bulletin. And thanks to modern technology, I think most of us can probably plug it into some form of a GPS and get there. We hope that you will come. Everyone is welcome.
So please, after the service, we hope that you'll join us for the potluck. If you will turn to the other page, just across from there, next Sabbath, we will be at Camp Winnikig for our worship service. And we hope that you'll join us for that as well. And we will begin here for those who do not want to attend an outdoor service. There will be an early service in the youth chapel from nine to 10. And then in the bulletin here, it says at 10 o'clock up at Winnikeg, the service will begin up there. So if you want to go to Winnikeg, we'd love to have you there. And if maybe that is not for you, we will have a service here at nine o'clock. The second point of emphasis I want to make about this is tomorrow is your last shot. If you want to have a meal at Winnikeg and you don't feel like spending $20 for that, you need to make sure that you take care of your reservation by tomorrow. Otherwise, I hope that you have a $20 bill with you to take care of the meal. I'm sure it will be delicious. Whether you think it's worth $20 or not, I will leave up to you and your wallet to determine. But please make sure that you pay attention to that, okay? It's right in here. Third thing is the insert on our grow groups. We have a variety of grow groups that we will be introducing to you. I ask that you take time to look this over. Maybe one speaks to you, maybe two speak to you. We've tried to make them in such a manner that you can attend more than one because they are not multiple days. There is one that is multiple days and there are a couple that may still be on their way. And if so, we're going to introduce them to you as well as soon as we can. Please look at this. We ask that you sign up for them, participate in them. And then looking around this room, there are a lot of very capable, very educated, very talented individuals who are more than capable of leading your own grow group. We'd love it if you would lead one out. I know we'd love it because I'm the one who's organizing the grow group. So I speak for myself and others that we'd love it if you would do that. And it doesn't matter if you're not certain what you would do. I waited almost three years before I did my first grow group because I wasn't certain what I could do that anyone would be interested in doing. But if you have something, we'd love to have you help us out with that. We'd also love it if you'd sign up for the ones that are here. The last thing that I want to call attention to is not in your bulletin. Uh, and that is in regards to our continual meetings as a vision committee. We continue to seek your input. We continue to ask that any ideas, names, suggestions, people, whatever it is that you have to share with us, we ask that you do so. When we met on August 11th, we had put out a call afterwards that if anyone had any more suggestions or potential new names for our church, that you share it with us. Since that time, we have received over 30 name suggestions we have received multiple forms filled out suggesting what do we think about doing this? How about our church try this? There are plenty of things that we have received and we thank you for that and we've discussed them all. But there's still more that you can share and that we can do. So please, we will be stopping the name submissions here middle of next month. If you have something, please share with us. In addition, if you have other things that you would like to suggest that we could do as a church, please share. I will give an example. If you have been coming to this church for some time, you're fully well aware of the fact that one of the big things that we do as a church are our Thanksgiving baskets, which are a blessing to the community. What you may not realize is despite the fact that it runs very smooth, there is still a major need for people to help out. The people who head it up do a wonderful job. They are not the only ones who can do that job. They need your help. They need my help. They need all of our help. That's just one small way we can help out. We all know what it's like to pick something up by ourselves. If it's 100 pounds, it's heavy. If 10 people pick it up together, provided it's a long 100 pounds, it's a lot easier. If you have a chance to help out, we ask that you do so. And if you're wondering where you can, myself, anyone on the vision committee, anyone involved with the Thanksgiving baskets, Anyone can talk to you about that. This is the not the last you'll hear of it, and we hope this is not the last you'll think of it. We need your help. Once again, we're very grateful that you are here at our worship service this morning, and we pray the Lord's blessing on each one of us as we participate in it. <laughs>